Namaste. So let's talk about chapter 17. <laughs> chapter 17 of the Shiva Purana Vidyeshwara Sanghita is huge. <laughs> I had to break it up into three parts to make it manageable. And this is really about chanting. Chanting and its results. Mantra. Okay. Um, he talks about Aung. Pranava. Pranava means a boat for crossing the ocean of material existence. And of course, pranava, Aung, is used in the beginning of every Vedic mantra and at the end of recitation of prayers or any uh, spiritual function. This is the primal sound vibration. It is the, uh, the key, actually, to the spiritual world. You know, you want to go not to heaven, but beyond heaven, to the eternal spiritual world, well, you need this key. <laughs> this is how you get in. Aum. And many of the mantras are keys to different realms within the spiritual world or in the higher planetary systems, but they all depend on Aum for their potency, for their effectiveness. So Aum is the primal mantra, and then depending on the destination that you wish to attain, you will add another mantra, usually consisting of the name of the god or goddess that you wish to approach, and Namaha. Huh? So we have Om Namaha Shivaya. Now when Namaha, or any Ashvarga, uh, occurs in the middle of a line, it's not pronounced directly. Only at the end of the line, Namaha. Okay, so the Shiva mantra, the uh, Panchakshara mantra, five-syllable mantra, can be pronounced either Namah Shivaya or Shivaya Namaha. But in either case, it's prefaced with Aung, Aungkar, the Pranava. It goes by many different names. But in every case, it's composed of three transcendental letters. Now, when people in the West uh, practice yoga and stuff like this, they usually say Om. Om is a different mantra. And first of all, a mantra like that it should be a bija mantra, a seed mantra, a root, huh, for the other uh, effects of the mantra to grow from. So that means it has to end with a nasal M. Aum. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's not Aum. Aum. Like A-U-N-G. Huh? So, this makes it into a bija mantra, a seed mantra. And from that seed sprouts the potency of the rest of the mantra. Aung is the seed. Nama Shivaya is the plant that grows from it. And entrance into Shiva's realm is the fruit or the, the produce created by that plant. Okay. How many times do you have to chant to get any result? <laughs> well, in this chapter, he talks about 500,000 repetitions. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? 500,000 mantras? Whoa. But actually, how much is it? Well, in a previous chapter, I think it was chapter 12, 
he talks about 2,000 names a day. 1,000 in the morning, 1,000 in the evening, during the junctions between day and night, sandhi. Sandhi means the time when it's neither day nor night, just before sunrise, just after sunset. So these are the most potent times for any spiritual practice, and chanting mantras is the, the best spiritual practice. So that's when you should chant. How much should you chant? Well, one round on a mala is 108 mantras. So let's call it 100 in round numbers. So to chant a thousand is 10 malas. So I timed it the other day. It takes about four minutes. Not chanting too fast. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. And if you take four minutes times 10 malas, that gives you 1,000 names. That takes about 40 minutes. That's not bad. 40 minutes in sunrise, sun, sunset, twilight, 40 minutes. You know, anybody can find this time. Anybody can find, like uh, when I was a Krishna devotee, mother cow has something to say here. Uh, when I was a Krishna devotee, we used to chant 16 rounds of the Krishna mantra, and that took about an hour and a half, an hour and 20 minutes, something like that. So we could find the time, uh, even in a busy day of other services and stuff. So it's certainly possible to find the time to chant for 40 minutes, Aum Namah Shivaya. So assuming you chant 2,000 a day, then 500,000 is 250 days, less than a year. And of course, if you chant more, it's quicker. So in less than a year, or let's say a year, if you're really lazy, you know, <laughs> sometimes you chant, sometimes you don't, uh, you can rack up 500,000 mantras easily in a year. And, you know, if you live for 50 years, that's 2,500,000 mantras. That's enough mantras to promote you from a shudra birth to a brahmana birth in the next life. Or to attain higher realms uh, even beyond brahma loka. So this chanting is very potent. It's very powerful. It's the best way to erase bad karma. You know, why are we suffering? Why are there so many restrictions in our lives? Like, why do we have to work for a living, for example? Why do we have to be subject to some idiot boss and idiot politicians? Huh? People who seek power are usually not too intelligent. <laughs> That's just the way the world is. The people who want power shouldn't have it. And the people who don't want power are the ones who should be in power because they really, really they don't care, you know, about power. So they can be fair, but they don't get positions of power because they aren't willing to compete and play the, the game, you know? So why are we subject to all these limitations? Why do we only live, you know, 70, 80 years, for example? In previous yugas, lifespan was much longer. A thousand years in Dvapara Yuga, ten thousand in Treta Yuga, and a hundred thousand years in Satya Yuga. So the reason is bad karma. So to get rid of these, you should chant transcendental mantras, transcendental sound vibration, Shabda Brahman or Nada. Okay? Aum is Nada. And Nama Shivaya is Shabda Brahman, sound, huh? Brahman in the form of sound. So these mantras take you to very interesting places. If you're chanting out of a sense of obligation, oh, I got to do this chant, you know, 
<laughs> you won't get much results. But if you're chanting out of love, or if you're chanting even out of interest, hmm, let's see what happens when I chant this mantra, you know? You will get results, and the results will be wonderful. I promise. There is no downside to chanting mantras. There's only upside, only benefit. And the more you chant, the more you invest, you know, the more the benefits come. And in the second part of uh, chapter 17, he talks about the benefits and how every time you chant another 500,000 mantras, you go to a higher realm or a higher position in life. If you're a Shudra, you become a Vaishya. If you're a Vaishya, you become a Kshatriya. If you're a Kshatriya, you can become a Brahmana, and even a Brahmana can go beyond that and become a denizen of the higher worlds, a sage, a Rishi. Huh? That's what we want. We want to be enlightened. We want to be Rishis, celestial sages, those who get sent on missions to different planets when they get in trouble, uh, like this one is right now. <laughs> but in Kali Yuga, you know, you really can't do much because the whole system is against you. The whole nature is against you. Kali Yuga is meant to degrade the intelligence of human society to an animal level. And then Vishnu comes and kills everybody and it starts all over again with a new Satya Yuga. So in Kali Yuga, the masses cannot attain enlightenment, but the individual can by going against the trends of the masses. This is a very important point, that in order to attain enlightenment, basically you have to buck the system. You have to go against everything. Your watchword should be, if it's popular, it's wrong. Because in Kali Yuga, the mass of peoples are idiots, right? It's designed that way. There's lead in the drinking water. There's forever chemicals in the air, even in the umbilical blood in the womb. Huh? There's cancer-causing chemicals. I mean, we are living in a world that has been degraded by industrial activities and war and so many nasty things. So the best option is to do everything you can to get out. Do everything you can to attain a higher realm in the next life, because there will be a next life. Even Buddha says that there will definitely be a next life, a next world beyond this world. So how do we attain these higher worlds? By mantras, by seva by spreading this knowledge of the Shiva Purana, of devotional service to Shiva, and performing it ourselves, showing by example how it makes one's life better. Huh? If you've been following this channel for any length of time, you know, say a year or two, you've seen me go through different struggles, times when things weren't so good, you know, weren't so great, but you also have seen me come through it and come out of it and my life improving, you know, even after having COVID twice, you know, <laughs> and now I'm getting back full function, physical body and intelligence, and everything is going very well. Why? Because I never stopped chanting my mantra when I was worshiping the goddess. I was chanting the Mahashodashi mantra every day. And now that the love of Shiva has bloomed in my heart, miraculously, <laughs> also a blessing from Ma, now everything is accelerating even more. And now we're building a temple and uh, so many people are getting involved. I mean, it's really happening. So... You have seen, if you've been following this channel, all these changes take place. Now, this is not luck. And, and it's really not even skill. <laughs> it's, 
It's dogged determination to keep going with the sadhana no matter what. In fact, when things get difficult, that's the time you want to double down on your sadhana because your sadhana is the way through. It's the way out. It's the way up to a higher level of being and ultimately to attain the complete enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.